G'day, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and host of our popular podcast, Follow the Money. And today I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to our brand new podcast, Dollars and Cents, with Greg Jericho, Chief Economist at the Australia Institute and the Centre for Future Work, and popular columnist of Grogonomics with Guardian Australia. In Dollars and Cents, each week, Greg Jericho will demystify the latest economic figures, how they impact you, and what they can tell us about the economy. G'day, Greg. Hi, Ebony. Before we get stuck in, how long have you been writing economics for Guardian Australia? Uh, since day one of Guardian. I, I was there right from the start. In fact, I was even there before the start. Uh, <laughs> Catherine Murphy and Lenore Taylor, who was then political editor, the three of us were actually in the budget lockup about three weeks before Guardian Australia went live. We were kind of doing a practice run. So, wow. and my first column went up on on day one. So I've been there since 2013, <laughs> and yeah, it's been a nice decade, uh, a fairly interesting decade for economics. Uh, certainly not boring, and uh, it continues to be that way. Yeah, and you've written uh, columns, you know. Uh, each week, if not multiple times a week for many, many years now. So as an economist, what kind of things are you looking for in economic data to tell you what's happening with the economy? And and how can the kind of data that you look at and write about help us understand what's happening in the economy? Yeah, it's a good question because obviously there's the standard stuff like GDP figures and unemployment rates, um, which you always have to write about. Um, or certainly when I was writing more than one column a week, I'd always write about unemployment. And that's kind of a, a sort of general thing that everyone thinks you need to know. But what I like doing is kind of looking at some of the more niche figures and trying to sort of tease out what does this actually mean and also try and combine a few things and, and explain to to people that there's so much data out there. You know, the ABS is releasing data almost every day and it's not just counting these things because it just hasn't got anything better to do with its time. Pretty much all the data it looks at says something about either our society or our economy. And so, you know, even just uh, doing what for an economist might seem fairly obvious, but for many sort of, I guess, lay people or just general members of the public wouldn't think to look at things like, you know, um, when home loans go up or down or the growth of home loans go up or down, that tells us something about what's going to happen to house prices in the next three to six months because you only take out a home loan because you're thinking of buying a house or you're, you know, you're getting pre-approval to buy a house. So if a lot more people are taking out home loans, that generally means there's a lot more people who are trying to buy a house and so it's a good way of predicting the future. And, and so looking at things like that, which, you know, if you just have a your standard sort of economics uh, reported, they might just report, oh, the, the number of home loans went up and it's kind of just leaves it there as though that's the news. But I like trying to explain why this is important, what it says about what's going on and gives us a bit of insight into things. And, you know, the yeah. same with, you know, things like uh, inflation. I'll always be reporting on the consumer price index and saying, you know, it went up 6% or 5.4%. 4, but what I like doing is really digging into the figures, which requires a little bit of uh, enjoyment of Excel spreadsheets, which bizarrely I have, <laughs> and actually seeing, okay, well, what's actually going up or down? What's what's causing all of this rather than just perhaps regurgitating a media release? I, I like kind of just getting in there and, and finding some things that only an economist would think to look at, but then explaining it in a way so that you don't have to be an economist to understand because that's one of the big problems with all this data. It does come in Excel spreadsheets. Who the heck wants to open up them? <laughs> well, I kind of do, but I what I really like is explaining things to people so that they can understand that they, they actually feel smarter after reading my columns. That's kind of my, always my hope. But also, you know, doing so in a way that, you know, you don't have to dumb things down. People just need to have it explained to them and hopefully in an entertaining way. And then that gives them a bit of power, a bit of understanding so that they can think about the economy in a different way. Mm. 
A sliver of good news for workers tonight, with new figures showing pay slowly catching up with inflation. Australian wages have grown at their fastest rate on record in the last quarter. Wages were up 1.3% in the September quarter. The biggest jump in the 26-year history of the Australian Bureau of Statistics Wage Price Index. 184,000 workers on the minimum wage, a real wage rise above inflation of 8.6%. The ABS says the uptick was the result of the Fair Work Commission's increase to the minimum wage. They rose, they went up. 1.3 is higher than 1.2. We are closing the gap that we inherited from those officers. Wages under this government continue to go backwards. What matters is whether those wages can buy more or less than they could a year ago. It'll make an incredible difference to these workers. That's the strongest pay increase we've seen in 26 years. And that would be great if inflation wasn't so high. So, Greg, this week uh, there's been some new labour figures come out. Tell us about that data and what jumped out at you this week. Well, we've actually had a couple this week. The big one that I wrote on was the the latest wage price index, and that's every three months the ABS, the Bureau of Stats, puts out the latest wage growth figures. Um, and it does it for every industry. It does it for public sector, private sector, all the states and everything. And uh, one of the, the interesting things that uh, we saw this quarter in the September quarter, which takes into account July August and September months is that uh, we had a record increase in in wages in that quarter. The total wages went up one point three percent, and private sector went up one point four percent, which was smashed kind of the the previous record of one point two percent that occurred way back in in June two thousand and eight, sort of mm-hmm. just as we were about to hit the GFC. So hopefully that's not an arbiter of what's about to come. But it was a real sense of, okay, we've got um, a really good increase in wages. And my kind of take on it is that it's, and it's something that is almost a natural, sort of a a natural response that has become so damn embedded in everyone that you think, oh, wages went up. Oh no, that's bad because the Reserve Bank will probably raise interest rates or, oh, something's going wrong. That's, it's not good. And I'm like, no, you know, we should actually be happy that wages are going up. Wages <laughs> going up is good for people, especially when we've had, you know, a couple of years of really bad wages. Yeah, definitely. It is uh, it is the kind of thing that normally you would expect people to greet, you know, with open arms, best thing that could happen to a person. It, I think it's it's a real indication of just how indoctrinated we've become by, you know, you can call it neoliberal sort of talk, but... But the kind of media reportage we always get is things like... The big question is whether today's data makes another rate hike from the RBA more or less likely. Many economists are now saying this will push the Reserve Bank into increasing interest rates again. And economists say we shouldn't be concerned about extra pressure on interest rates. Oh, there was really strong profits in the last quarter or someone's produced record profits or there's been huge mining investment and mining profits. Gee, Australia's economy is so good. We we kind of think of profit growth as great and then wage growth is, oh, have the unions got in too much control or, oh, is this going to, how's this going to hurt profits? And it's like, well, hang on, the last couple of years, profits have been doing pretty damn well and wages have been awful. So it's, it's only right and that we should uh, have a bit of a reverse and that wages start going up. And the good thing with this last quarter is is it really was kind of broad spread. A lot of people I know when I report it go, oh, yeah, that's probably all the rich people uh, who are getting the really big wages. And it's actually not. This, this quarter, the September quarter every year, is always kind of a bit of a big one because it takes into account the Fair Work Commission's um, decision on the minimum wage and award wages. And this year round... Those people got a or people on awards got a five point seven five percent wage increase, which is you know a big one, and of course that kind of flowed through into the figures, and so a lot of the the big growth was kind of driven from the the lowest paid, and another really big um, driver of the of the growth in this quarter was uh, last year there was a decision to actually give aged care workers a fifteen percent pay rise basically because they, their um, working conditions are terrible, the amount they were paid was terrible, they really deserved a pay rise more than just 
the normal. And so this was kind of out coming out of an election commitment, but also, um, you know, just a real response of trying to restore some some fairness to to the people who work in that sector. And so, you know, there's a couple hundred thousand aged care workers who got a massive increase, you know, massive increase one off, but only, you know, still very low pay compared to everyone else. So that all flows into a really big boost. But, you know, the good news is that, it, you know, it wasn't just your top end of town getting an oversized pay rise. Yeah. And you said September's normally like a, a big uh, quarter for wages because everyone who's on an award, as you said, that fair work decision uh, comes through in the September quarter. What happens in the December quarter? Would you expect that this growth will con- wages growth will continue? Um, I th- well, it's always hard to say. You, we certainly should not be getting another record one quarter. the The September quarter is always the biggest quarter, or it, g- it generally is, mm. because also there's a, a number of enterprise agreements that are linked to the start of the financial year, and so they get a bit of a boost there that they don't get in, in other quarters. And also, you know, a lot of individual contracts are, are negotiated to go from the start of the financial year. So that's why always that September quarter is a bit of a bit of a outlier. We kind of would expect uh, overall, you know, the wage growth to, to stay around the, the 4% annual growth that it is. Probably the quarterly will go down a bit, but what we have seen over the past year or so is is certainly an increase in the size of wages that wage growth uh wage how can i put it uh, pay rises that people are getting you know um a year ago or so ago only about 30 percent of people who were getting a pay rise were getting one above four percent now it's about 40 percent of people are getting that amount so we'd expect that to kind of stay and then uh you know, and hopefully while inflation keeps going down, that means that uh, people's living standards will, will keep going up. And that was what I wanted to come to. Firstly, uh, is there a difference between public sector and private sector when it comes to, to wages growth? Yeah. And then we might come back to inflation. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the problems for the public sector is for for many places over a decade now, they've been subject to... Uh, wage caps. So governments, whether it's state government or Commonwealth governments, have have put a limit on the size of their wage increase. Sometimes, you know, two percent, putting a limit on that, not being able to get a wage above that. And what we've seen over the past decade is that this has meant that public sector wages have grown by less than the private sector, which is historically kind of odd. Normally, public sector workers, because they generally don't get the big bonuses. Um, don't get well apart from some of the uh, you know the governor of the reserve bank and some of the permanent or the secretaries of departments they're generally not as as highly paid as as executives in in the private sector and so generally the sort of the balance to that is they they've got stronger actual growth in wages and historically the public sector used to kind of be the guide you know companies could say, oh, the public sector is getting a 3.5% wage rise. Well, that's kind of the the ceiling. That's the base. So, you know, we'll offer you 3%. What's happened with the, the wage caps is it's kind of flipped. Uh, public sector, would, because they were having a cap on 2%, wage, private sector were going, well, we're going to, we can give you a little bit more than that, but not much more. And so it was actually, instead of public sector wages kind of helping raise the entire wage growth in the economy it was actually keeping it all down now that started to unwind as we've got labor governments in in various states and also the reality that you can't have a two percent wage cap when inflation's going at six percent that's just incredibly cruel and so we are seeing public sector wages begin to catch up they're still a fair way behind the private sector and especially in places like South Australia and actually the ACT, mm-hmm. well behind. In in South Australia, for example, the private sector are, are getting about a 4.6% wage growth compared to just 1.8% in the public sector. So, you know, it's it really is something that needs needs redress. Public sector workers have, have kind of been shafted for the past decade, and they're the ones who have really suffered in the 
during the last couple of years because public sector workers more often than not are on enterprise agreements. They're often uh, you know two or three years in length. So while the big increase in prices has occurred, they're still on agreements that were that were done you know before inflation uh, really occurred, and so they've got a lot of catch up to do. But Finally, we are starting to see the public sector workers actually be able to get some decent wage growth. Mm. I just want to come to the fact that we are still in the midst of, you know, um, high inflation or I guess it's coming down, but uh, an inflationary period and people genuinely having problems with the cost of living and in a cost of living crisis. So just how good are these figures? Will people be feeling like they're going to be getting ahead or does it make up for like, the, all the lost wages growth we've had over recent years? Uh, they'll feel good for the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> they might, look, if, if they got a wage rise in the last three months, they're probably feeling okay because at least they, you know, most people were getting fairly decent uh, wage rises, but they were still well below um, inflation. And it's a case of, yes, the, the quarterly figures you could sort of say that uh, they're starting to be above the increase in prices. But if you look over the past year, so the last year, overall wages grew 4%. Well, inflation went up 5.4%. The price of non-discretionary items, those items that you can't avoid paying like electricity, rent, gas, petrol, they went up 5.5%. So even with this kind of improved, even with this record uh, one quarter wage growth, we still lost one and a half percent of our real wages over the past year. And if you sort of go back to where we were before the the pandemic, you know, over that time, private sector wages have risen 10 percent since sort of March 2020. So just before the pandemic hit, since then, wages have gone up 10 percent. Prices of all goods have gone up 16%. I mean, that's that's a real discrepancy there, basically a loss of 6% value. In effect, you, your wage buys about 6% less now than it did three years ago. And that's going to take a long time to recover, a really long time. I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking a decade or so because one of the problems that we always know with wage growth, and this kind of goes back to where we're at the start, where whenever you hear wage growth, everyone say, well, I don't know if that's a good thing, is that wages historically should go up faster than prices. That's kind of the whole point of things. That's that's how we get um, better living standards. But the Reserve Bank and governments to a lesser extent, but def- definitely the Reserve Bank and certainly employer groups really are wary of wages rising too much above inflation. So as inflation comes down, they're going to want to keep wages only sort of equal with or just a little bit above inflation. That means that it's going to take a long time to recover six, a 6% loss. And uh, essentially what we saw over the last sort of 15 years or so is that it took about 10 years to go from 2009 to 2019 to sort of a, a fairly you know big six percent increase in in our real wages, and it took three years to undo that. So it's going to take at best nine years to sort of recover it. And given what the Reserve Bank is sort of suggesting, it'll probably take a bit longer than that. So that's the problem with things like this: losing value of your wages takes a long time to undo because there's always pressures to keep wages down. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that just about covers everything, Greg. <laughs> It does. I mean, uh, one of the good things we are seeing is that, uh, you know, the latest unemployment figures out today um, show that unemployment isn't going up too much. It's it's sort of holding and wages are still sort of rising, even even as unemployment is, is uh, you know, staying around the 3.6, 3.7% area. Hopefully we can keep unemployment low. That should enable wage growth to keep keep up around this 4%. And uh, as the prices of things, you know, certainly things that we get from overseas like petrol, um, as they start to fall, hopefully we can start really seeing some some good improvement in, in the ability of people to to spend money with their wages and not feel like they're sort of back where they were 10, 13 years ago. It's a, it's a nice sort of little turning point we're at. Uh, we've, we've stopped falling 
but it's a long way to go to recover. But uh, I think it's it's good to see wages going up, and I'm I'm going to sort of lead the the cheer squad for, for strong <laughs> wages, and and hopefully uh, we can get back to a point where you know we don't immediately just sort of start worrying that wages are going up and thinking, oh, you know, what's what's the bad news to, to follow and actually think, well, that's what we should be wanting. We should be wanting strong wages. Workers should be able to bargain effectively to get better wages and uh, all in all that, that adds up to people having more money to spend, which means that more people are employed and I think a, a better and happier world. Yeah. Well, certainly uh, you can add me to that cheer squad for, for wages, <laughs> Greg. <laughs> thanks, Greg, and congratulations on the new podcast. No worries. Thanks, Seb. This episode was recorded on Thursday, the 16th of November, 2023, and things may have changed since recording. You can find Greg Jericho's latest grogonomics column at Guardian Australia and all his latest research at australiainstitute.org.au. Greg is on Twitter at Grog's Gamut. The Australian Institute is at the Oz Institute with an AUS, and our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening.